I'm going to talk about insect protein as a possible part of the solution to the coming problem that we've just heard so eloquently described. Um, and, um, but first of all, I just want to set insects in some sort of context for you, because I'm sure that most of you aren't entomologists. So I just want to run through some of the basic things. Now, there's an awful lot of insects in the world, um, and at the moment we know about 1.25 million species have been described. We suspect there are somewhere between 4 and 12 million species yet to be discovered, and of these, 1,900 species are regularly eaten around the globe. So, a very small percentage. Um, insects are a crucial part of our biosphere, and they're a crucial part of our food production system. They pollinate an awful lot of our crops, um, and so they are uh, vital in that respect. They are also key players in the role of biodegradation within the biosphere. So they clear up all the rubbish that all the other organisms leave lying around, basically. So, sort of, if it's a, you know, um, think like this bit of a monkey poo, to, you know, dead plants, you know, sort of, um, and bodies. They all get cleared away by insects. So they are crucial there. And as they are very abundant, because there is a lot of species, there's also huge numbers of them, you know, sort of, in any given place at any given time. Oh, sorry. And uh, so... They provide a very good food source for a wide range of organisms. And of course, they also f they're also eaten by many, many people around the world. So two, two billion people around the globe eat insects as a regular part of their, of their daily food intake. So, so this isn't something that's done in extremis. It's not a thing that when, when the chips are down, well, we've got to eat some insects. It's not a survival thing. It's not like the SAS. People look forward to it. So, um, uh, it's, it's, and why, why? Why? Because they are rich in protein. They're rich in protein and they are rich in minerals and vitamins. It's a very good nutritional package. A good bowl of insects will set you right for the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, sort of. um, Back in 2008, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations became really interested in the role of insects, sorry, the role that insects might play in solving the coming food crisis. And they held a big conference in Chiang Mai in Thailand, and they looked at how does Southeast Asia use insects as part of their, of their food production systems? What do they eat? How do they do it? You know, um, and that, on the back of that, that was very successful. That, that triggered a lot of interest globally. And then this May, they, were, they had another big conference in Rome, and there they discussed edible insects in Western societies. So, and this, uh, this report is available on the internet. It's a free downloadable PDF. Just put edible insects, FAO, into Google, and it'll land on your desktop. And, and so with big players like this getting involved and really, you know, stirring up a lot of interest right across Western Europe, um, the European Commission have invited all member states to investigate how their countries ca can raise the profile of insect protein in Western diets. And here in the UK, um, the food standards um, uh, sort of... Um, organization has, uh, has circulated a questionnaire to a whole range of people asking, what are we doing in the UK? What I was going to do is just have a quick nip around the world and see who eats what where. You know? So if you go to South Africa, um, caterpillars are the big thing. And there's a huge industry. Nine billion tons of caterpillars are processed and sold in markets around southern Africa. And it's $85 million worth of trade. So it's, it's not small potatoes. This isn't some cottage industry. Um, so, um, and if we look at um, Malawi, now this is one just a I've thrown in just to show you the diversity of insects that are eaten. In Lake Malawi, 
When it was first discovered, European explorers called it the Burning Lake because every now and then huge clouds of black smoke would erupt over the center of the lake and they wondered where, you know, how it was, why was it on fire? But it wasn't smoke. There were dense clouds of tiny midges. These are phantom midges of the genus Chaeoborus and there are just millions of them. They emerge um, synchronously, and local fishermen go out with nets and they, they row their boats out and they swipe nets through these dense clouds, collect the, um, the uh, tiny midges, and then they squeeze them into a pate, which they then take back, and this is then deep fried. And the whole village eagerly awaits this. Children are bouncing up and down, you know, trying to, you know, um, get the first bite of the uh, midge pate. So, um, and then in Japan, um, in expensive restaurants, you can go in and you can get a dish of zamazushi. And this, these are caddisfly larvae. If there are any fly fishermen here, you'll know what caddisflies are. But the larvae of the caddisflies, they live on the bottom of our our streams and rivers, and they make little cases. And uh, um, the, um, the uh, guys in Japan, they harvest these every year, at a certain time, and then these are shipped off to restaurants all around Japan, and they're highly prized, a great delicacy. Um, silk is a product that you'll probably know all about. This comes from the silk moth. Um, the silk is, uh, um, the caterpillars are fed on mulberry leaves, the, uh, the, uh, the um, larvae then pupate, and when they pupate, they weave a silk and cocoon around them from a single strand of silk. So the silk farming process is to boil all the, all the silken um, cocoons, kill the larvae, and then unravel those single strands of silk, which leaves you with hundreds and hundreds of silk moth pupae, which are then eaten by many people across Southeast Asia, and they're also fed to livestock. So, and in case you're thinking, okay, this is all very interesting, um, but um, um, you know, this is England. We don't do that. I'm sorry, you've been doing it ever since you were born. Um, everything we eat is contaminated with, with insects. We, we can't keep them out. So this is just a list of some of the maximum permissible ingredients that you can see within the food that you've eaten. So you've, so you've all been entomophages since you were born. Um, the way forward in the future um, is to farm insects. Many of the insects that are eaten around the world are collected you know, from the wild. But if we're going to feed large numbers of people, then we need to farm them. And if you look at the um, comparison of crickets to cows, you can see that um, if you look at the, f the food conversion ratio, 10 kilograms of feed gives you one kilogram of cow. 1.7 kilograms of feed gives you one kilogram of, of, of cricket. So they're far more efficient. If you look at the maturation time, for cows, 24 months before you can make your harvest. For crickets, one month. If you look at the space it takes, you know, 100 kilograms of, of, of cattle protein, you need 50 square meters. For a cricket, it's five. So you can see that insects are incredibly more efficient. So if we want to produce protein, animal protein in the future, then the efficiencies here, you can see if you multiply all those three things together, the efficiencies are incredible. And the reason that they are so much more efficient at generating the protein is that they don't waste energy converting it into heat to keep them warm. They rely on ambient temperatures. So what are the challenges? The challenges are, for insect farming, are to select appropriate insects. We have 1,900 insects are currently eaten. Which ones of those are, are sort of easy to farm? Which one are going to be good farming insects. Um, w the jury is out. We, we are still, you know, sort of working on that, you know, sort of, um, we have to think about food safety. If we're going to farm insects, you know, food safety is a very important issue. Animal welfare is another, you know, um, you know, we have to make sure that the insects are going to be, you know, well looked after and they have 
a reasonable life? You know, sort of, is it sustainable? You know, can we source suitable waste streams to feed them on? Because the idea is that we're not going to go down the same route as as aquaculture, where we feed fish to fish. We want to um, have um, insect farms that use waste streams that are currently not being used. I think Ed's going to talk about this in a minute. Um, sort of, but um, so. If we can use, you know, things like um, restaurant waste, uh, domestic waste, uh, and even abattoir waste, there's a range of projects that have been using those things. Um, Large-scale production. At the moment, there are insect farms that produce insects for um, the pet trade, and they are fairly big, but um, they can't produce huge numbers, um, and it has to be affordable. Um, at the moment, sort of, if you want to buy a kilogram of crickets, it'll cost you about 30, 40 quid. You're not going to nip into the supermarket and drop those in your stir fry. Um, that's a very expensive uh, addition to your meal. So sort of insect farming has to reduce the cost. So that's the other thing. And uh, then just to raise the profile of one project that's running here in the UK, ENTO are a group of graduates from Imperial College and the Royal College of Art, and they produce insect vegetable pâtés. Um, if you go onto onto the internet, you can find Eat Ento. We'll take you straight to their website, and they turn up at at festivals and other events, and they will offer it and they present it in the same way that you present sushi. So, one of the big problems with presenting insects to eat is that. Most people are pretty disgusted by, oh, that's, oh, I'm, I'm not eating that. But, um, but by presenting it in this very attractive and colorful way, they, they bypass that. It looks cool. It's very fashionably presented. It's well designed. Um, so we need to think about that. So the other big thing that we need to do is to overcome public perceptions. So, I hope that in not too many years, maybe some school lunch boxes will look like this. So, thank you. If you look at, particularly in Britain, uh, where we seem to be so wary of langoustine, which I think are fabulous, and it's just because they got they got claws yeah. and eyes. The notion that we'll eat uh, insects as whole insects seems to me slightly unlikely. That there are a couple of. Um, uh, research projects underway in European universities to liberate a kind of animal protein from insects. Is that not more likely to be the way that actually that's going to find its way to market as a, as a substitute for meat proteins? Um, well, I think both approaches are going to... I think the process you described, yeah, that is very viable and that is going to happen. At the moment, that happens in Mexico. They make an insect flour, which they use to make tortillas. Um, so that sort of thing could easily come to the UK, you know, extracted proteins. And in fact, sort of, um, if you remove the chitinous exoskeleton from, from insects, then it's almost pure protein. You get sort of, you know, um, it's about, you know, sort of 80 and 90 percent protein then, which is, uh, it's a pretty good package. So, um, but I think presenting entire insects is, is also just one of those cultural things that we need to overcome because, um, if you think, Back just 20 years ago, if you'd said to any Englishman, you know, the Japanese eat this thing called sushi, it's raw fish, and they'd go, whoa, you're joking. Um, but now, every town is overrun with sushi bars, it seems. So I think if the marketing is done in the right way, and if, if, yeah, if people like yourselves, you know, sort of wave the flag and say, yeah, you know, sort of, you know insects are really delicious. And certainly, I have worked with a, a number of chefs now. We have cooked up a range of things. At the Chilton Sci um, Science Festival year before last, we had a session like this, and I worked with a local chef there. He had crickets that were um, um, coated in pesto, sandwiched between two bay leaves, dipped in batter and deep fried. They went like hotcakes. He couldn't make any. I, I suspect that's a victory of the deep fat fryer, but that's my point. <laughs> Peter, for the moment, thank you very much. Okay, Peter, thank you. Thank you.